So this is the John Youth Free Seminar Series uh, 2015. This is our third year organizing this on honor of the man himself. And um, I'm Pierre Richard Connolly from Physics and Engineering, for those of you that do not know me. So for this year, this is what we're going to have. I start off with just summarizing the work that's been done by students in the last three years. So last year, Dr. Williams started us with this. I thought, hmm, that was a very good idea, to kind of look at how we started this, these works and how they evolved over the years with many students. Then he's a, an alum that has graduated so many years ago and has uh, become a big man in the world that's going to come in and talk to us in the area of chemistry. And our own Dr. Matzo will talk about her research and in uh, the hope of getting some of you interested in working with her. Then we are privileged to have uh, two for one. Her husband is going to also come in and talk to us about some of the work, interesting work he's doing in computer science. And then the good fun, the real fun begins. So today, the students, so that's your last shot at me, those of you that are uh, graduating. Uh, last, last shot to ask me a bad question or something before you graduate out of your, or I fail you. Right? <laughs> so we have Chris Preble, Anthony Bilroa. Uh, Chris is talking about building a very innovative equalizer. Very interesting stuff. And um, Anthony is uh, looking at how you can uh, look at the speed of baseball back. Both, both, both very good project. And then right after him, we invite uh, another renowned person just like we did last year. This is a very young guy, extremely promising, has done a lot of good work. He has a PhD in both mathematics and physics. He's, he's really a heavyweight guy. So he's going to come to talk to us about some of the works he's doing. Um, so I'm very excited to have him around from Harvard. Then we continue with the fun. Betsy and Greg Peronto are going to tell us what they're doing. Betsy has been doing some work on trying to model the mother's heart and seeing whether or not these these models can be used to calm a baby. Very, very nice piece of work that she's doing. And, um, and then Greg is doing something very innovative of trying to do wireless mass that can function without, from a power tower. Um, pretty interesting stuff. Then Burley and Chris Wright and Dinesh. Then is looking at multipart detection. Multipart is what happens when signals go and you know, when, you, when you have a phone call that you're picking up and it's dropping, most 90 out of 100 is multipart. What's going on is that the signal goes out of your antenna, it looks for a tower, but what comes back is a whole bunch of other signals. And then the, its ability to deal with that level of signal is why it, it drops the call. So that's, and then that has a bunch of other applications. So it's a very difficult problem, very mathematically involved and then has been struggling with that, making some progress. And, um, and then we have uh, Chris White, where is he, he's not around, who's building a radar that was developed out of MIT. He's trying to build it and test it. And Dinesh is not here, what is that? Your, your title is not here. The title of your talk, they forgot it. Isn't that something? <laughs> All right, what are you doing Dinesh? Yeah, so Dinesh is doing another very innovative thing of trying to see if you can charge a phone without ever plugging it, just using renewable energy. Also a very good idea. And CJ and John, CJ is working on a 3D platform for games, very interesting work that he's doing using the Oculus Rift platform. And then John has been working with me for a couple of years now and probably is going to come out very heavyweight. If he can work in his presentation skills, people will be banging at his door to give him a job. That's how, how good his, 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 his thesis has been. Okay? So I have to close him in a room for three months or something and, and teach him how to present, you know, and then he'll be okay. So earthquake, actually this is a, this is a gruesome picture. Right? We don't think of earthquake as something that's so, so devastating like, for example, 
Last time we had an earthquake in Haiti, um, so many, in 2010, 230,000 people die in less than two hours. Okay? So this is very serious business, right? Particularly in underdeveloped countries with poor infrastructure, which AT is the case, right? So that, that was part of the motivation that I have to do this work uh, after I looked at some people that started doing work on it, and since I had some background that was conducive for this, I decided then that might be a good way to help the country if I could come up with something interesting. So today I'm going to give you some, some history very quickly, uh, tell you what the ionosphere is very quickly, tell you what earthquakes are very quickly, very, very quickly. And then what I'm really interested in is showing you where I started with this in 2010, and how the students have taken that work and evolved it over the years to where it is right now. Okay? And I, I think with this work that John is doing, we probably can publish three good papers in prime journals. It's that good. Seriously. Okay? I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, your head is not getting too big, right? <laughs> All right, so, so let's see, what's this? So a couple of guys, many, many years ago, tried a daring experiment. They took a kite, that you see them here, they attached an antenna to the kite, and their idea is that they're gonna radiate energy out of that kite from the antenna, and see whether or not this energy will be lost in space. In other words, you take a kite, you can understand that you put an antenna in it, it's radiating energy, and it's two things gonna happen. It's either that energy is gonna go straight out, you lose it, or it's going to bounce somewhere and somebody else can, can hear it, right? Of course, these guys didn't know at the time. That was the worst place to do the experiment because they didn't understand anything about the basic uh, properties of, of, of medium and all that. So they tried this, and this is what happened. They, they sat in some island, held that kite. This is actual picture of the thing. And they sent that information, and they had a receiver over here tr hoping that they will receive it. And the theory was... If they could receive that signal on the other end, there was something up there that was interacting with this signal to make them bounce back, okay? Now we've learned over the years that this thing can go straight through, right? If you have a GPS signal that's communicating with satellite out there, this signal is going straight through. They didn't know that at the time, so that was a very daring experiment, actually. And they were lucky, they did get the signal over here. So that was the first time that they say, uh-huh, there must be something over there that's interacting with the signal to make it bounce back. So these guys, uh, the first guy that started talking about concentration of energy charge up there, interacting with signal and making them do things, was, uh, was that Italian guy by the name of Marconi. So they went, they went on and looked at that and further came up with the idea that these, there's a, actually indeed a medium somewhere that's interacting with signal that can make them bounce. Okay? I'm going to move on. So where is that medium coming from? Here's the sun. The sun has ultraviolet rays coming from it that's eating, heating the earth. And as they, they heat the earth, they free energy in the, in the form of electrons. So that thing starts in the morning, accumulates by 12 peaks, and then it go back, goes back down. So what you have is just the accumulati uh, accumulation of charge of electrons somewhere suspended in there. Okay? And then when you send a signal, the signal actually is a beam of photon, it interacts with these, and that's what gives you various phenomena. You have this bending phenomenon. Some of them will bend a, a little bit and traverse anyway, so they'll be delayed. Some of them will be completely lost, the scattering effects, but in general, that's, that's what the ionosphere is. Just number of charge up there. So what does that have to do with earthquake? So let's, let me start telling you what earthquake is, right? So the theory that we have out there is that we have the Earth is covered with tectonic plates. Uh, so the tectonic plates, they move around each other very slowly. This movement is needed for interaction for, for the Earth to breed. Okay? So they have these movements. So this, you can have this movement, they're sliding across each other, which is a transform. They're sliding away from each other, which is a di divergent. They're sliding toward each other, which is a convergent. And then all of these motions are natural to the Earth. But from time to time, these motions become very big, 
they become bigger than expected, and that's what creates earthquake. And the theory is, what's making them become bigger is going on inside the Earth's core. All of this is theory. Nobody has been able to get inside the Earth's core and verify this, okay? So, <laughs> but we're saying that inside here, this, this, uh, uh, this very hot gas is down there, produce magnetic field that can travel, and I'm going to show you how we think this is, going, this is happening. And as they travel, they start creating what they call seismic activities, which means motion, more motion, and eventually that creates an earthquake. So, so here's the theory. So within the Earth's core, when we have this magnetic field, they create what's called crystal de deformation. The Earth is made of, some of the Earth is made of crystal. So the crystals deform. When they deform, they do, they what, they do what's, what's called dislocated electrons. So as, as they crush the dislocated electrons, and as the electrons are dislocated, they leave, and what they leave behind is a friend, which is called a hole, positive hole, right? They travel, they leave a friend behind, this friend is a hole. And these holes, when they propagate, they tend to, again, attract electrons, because now they're looking for another friend to mate, right? They tend to attract electrons. So as they attract electrons, particularly when these holes accumulate in the surface of Earth, uh, they can attract electrons that can travel to the, higher, to the heights, and when they travel, they interact with what I showed you before, that concentration of charge that was suspended in there, they change that concentration. They can change it destructively or constructively, which means you can have more charges or you can have less charges. That's the theory. Okay, nobody has been able to definitively verify this. But they've done a lot of work in the laboratory, at least to check it, to see this is not insanity, right? So the guys at NASA put to together a very elaborate experiment where they took a piece of granite, granite and they crushed it, right? That's what would happen in the sense of an earthquake, is that you have a piece of, of rock that's magnetized that you crushed with force. You know, in the case of convergent, right? Even if it was transformed, you're still crushing pieces of rock. And what they found is as they started crushing, they could actually measure a current. Okay? So how does that happen? Here's my reconstruction of what they did. So they start crushing this. Here's this piece of granite. Here's the, a press. They attach an air meter to it. Whoops. And that's something that can measure current. And they start pressing. Here's your, this is their first, first press. Here's the second press. You can start seeing these holes showing up. Of course, they, they, are, they are of the same polarity, so they, they repulse each other. They tend to accelerate the surface of Earth. And as they do that, they look for their friends. Right? They look for their friends so that they can mate. And these friends, under the, the influence of the electri electric field between the, the surface of the Earth and the bottom of the atmosphere, is how they travel up. Nobody has been able to verify that except in the laboratory here. So, but, but they did some very amazing experiment in that, very convincing. They can show you that if they make this bigger, so they are able to show you what kind of current you can measure here. And if you would say, well, this is like a microcosm of, of an earthquake. You are having thousands of kilometers of work crushing against each other. If you do that, could you see the, the kind of current level that you would expect? And the answer is yes. They were able to show that. I've shown some of their work in the past. I'm not going to belabor you with that, but that, that's been done. So, so there is inherently, potentially, a relationship between when rocks are being deformed and changes into the atmosphere. There is an actual connection that's being made between the two. And we think that looking at this problem over a number of years, we may be able to show when an earthquake is going to occur. So the, 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 the importance of this would be to be able to see changes in the atmosphere days or months before an earthquake so that you can warn somebody. Even if it was a, a, a day before, it will be a breakthrough over what we have right now. So it's very 
interesting research. Whether we'll get anywhere, that's a different question, right? So here's the earthquake in Haiti. It happened in a place called Leogan, which we go on a visit and mission trip uh, in, Aug in um, March, March, in spring break. So I'm excited to go back to Motherland to see what's going on out there. And potentially, maybe we can, we can take some measurement. I don't know. It, it, we, we're going with, a, with another group called Fusion, and they have their own idea. But so you can see the strength of the, of the earthquake. And even though it appeared over here, it really spread out in surrounding town. And I told you, just a, a small earthquake like that, very localized, extremely localized, nothing like Japan. 230,000 people died. That's a tragedy, right? Very, 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 very sad. Anyway, at the same time, I was still at with Ian at the time uh, when this thing happened, and you know, I spent uh, three days, couldn't, couldn't know if my family died or didn't because no phone worked for, for two days. So, um, and I was thinking about this, and I went home, and I was watching a YouTube video of a group of NASA scientists that were working on rock deformation. And they were showing this correlation I just discussed with you. And I said, huh, my thesis was in atmospheric modeling. I, I understand how changes happen in the atmosphere. So that wouldn't be a bad place to start doing some research, since at the time I was thinking about coming back to academia, right? So I found out at the same time that there was a satellite um, called Demeter that the French owned and that they put in orbit and their sole purpose was to go around the Earth and measure whether or not there were charges being generated around faults. So they had this thing going around, particularly fault lines, that is places where seismic activities were greater than other places within, within um, the plates. And so they had this around three, three years sitting up there and it had, it had this instrument in here that they call the Langmuir uh, instrument song de Langmuir, which was measuring with this probe here, just measuring how many electrons is surrounding that probe at a different height. And they go, went around and did that. So I went and looked at, I started looking at just one year of that data. And I can show you what that looks like, okay? So here's uh, 2009 data. Uh, that's what, that October 2009, and let's see, what is this? Um, oh, they, all that is October. So looking at this, this data, that those, those are the plots I was generating. This cross here is Haiti, okay? Forget about this plot. This is something else that I don't want to talk about. So what the satellite did, it, it took data at a very high sampling weight, and they had a very low sampling weight, so this, this piece fits, fits here. So you have to put the two together to see what that looks like. So you can clearly see right over Haiti, this little peak is showing up here, okay? Um, here's another one. So th this is the high sampling data, low sampling data, this piece fits here, this piece fits here, and you get this. Again, you can see this peak showing, show, showing up around Haiti. So that started a number of investigations. I'm like, maybe there's something to this. So we're going to go back and look at two years before, one year before, three months, I mean six months, three months, one month. So we repeated the study, and the same thing showed throughout. Okay? And then we went, one year after, behavior is gone. Now, this is not to say there's anything to this, but at least there, where there's smoke, there might be fire, right? So there's a uh, it, it behooved us to look at this more. Uh, the first person that came in was Michael Bryan. And so I ended, I ended him this data, gave him some code that I'd written, and I say, what I want you to do is to, uh, kind of a stati statistical analysis. Look at an entire month, over an entire month, take all the data and look at, see what you see, and do it from month to month. Because this I was doing days. I mean, you could see something from a day which is completely misleading, right? could be due for all, from all kinds of other changes. But if you're looking at over a month period and you do it month by month leading to the earthquake and you see the same kind of behavior, maybe there's something there. So Michael Bryan started working on this. That was him presenting his thesis at the time. And uh, so here's a summary of his results. So here's this probe going around. And 
the probe is measuring this concentration of electron around it. And in order to see whether or not what we're measuring is as significant, what we're going to do is compare it with what we expect. So let's say the blue curve is real data. That is the data that we're measuring here, and the red curve is predictions. What we expect to see is that we want them to be closed, like this behavior is good. This one is good. We don't want to see something like this, right? Where there's a significant departure between the real data and the predictions. Because that will start making us ask questions, why is that the case? If it's agreeing everywhere, why is it that all of a sudden there's some places not agreeing? Particularly if it's over 80, right? <laughs> and if it's over 80, we're definitely worried that this may be telling us something. So that's what he did. So what you, I'm going to put a bullseye for you. What we're going to show you is that we're mostly going to have agreement on the outside. And right over Haiti, that's when we're going to see the differences from what Mike O'Brien did. So here's the three months before the earthquake. The red is prediction. The blue is real data. So what he's doing is plotting all the data for that month starting from September 17 to October 17, 2009. Nine. So you can see, basically, the model is predicting all this behavior here. And basically, nothing going on over 83 months before. Here's two months before. Still the same thing. Models, model is under predicting this, but it's still telling you there's a peak here. It doesn't tell you anything going on around here. Okay? Here's one month before. That's the first time that we see that Definitively, there's a difference between what's predicted and what the model shows. Okay? Model is saying you're supposed to be down here, and all of a sudden you have this peak here. Right over AD is right over here. Okay? So here's right before the earthquake, that's when you see the biggest difference. Okay? And here's one month after. Like I said, when they, where there's smoke, there may be fire, not definitively, but there may be. So that was the first piece of work that uh, Mike O'Brien did, and we went and presented that to, at the American Geophysical Union. It was very well received, so much well received that we were interviewed by two papers, and there's two articles out there on this, because they think it's very good work. So, All right, so after Michael came in, so of course the satellite is no longer in orbit. We don't have access to this data. But we found out that we can get the same amount of information from GPS data. So Joe Armstrong decided, first of all, he's going to look at GPS data and see how he can see, look at the same type of information from GPS data. So that was him defending his thesis in um, 2014. And here's what he did. So consider this is, this is the, the ionosphere here. You have a receiver in, on the ground. You have a satellite in orbit. And you're making a straight connection between the satellite and the receiver. And as you make that straight connection, you're measuring uh, the, the number of electrons along that line. How many electrons did you encounter along that line? They call that the total electron content, TEC. And you can plot that. Okay? So here's the kind of curve you have, very smooth curve. So when the satellite is far, is close, you get the highest value. Sorry, when satellite is far, you get the highest value. As it comes closest, you get lower, and it gets far away again, which is the way the satellite travel, right? Because when it's farther, this line is longer, right? So you're getting you're getting more electron, and when it's closer, this line is shorter. Yeah, it's decided to behavior smooth. That's what you expect to have. If if this is as smooth, you should see this being smooth, okay? But what happens when it's not smooth? which would be what we're talking about here. That is, either we have a pocket here that's increasing it, or we have a pocket that's taking away from it, due to this interaction that I described earlier. So instead of having this smooth thing, you're going to have two. You're going to have either something that all of a sudden starts dancing around, or you're going to have something that plunges all, all together. Just plunges, because it finds no electron, so the value goes down. That's not the way the ionosphere behaves. It doesn't behave like that unless there's something causing it. Okay? So the idea would be, can we use this information to look, do the same kind of analysis before earthquake occurs to see whether or not we're going to see a difference? Okay. And so
So Joe went, so it was good that Japan is covered, covered with receivers. So all these wet, wet dots are receivers. This, this country is covered. So it's an ideal laboratory for that work, right? So what, jo what Joseph did, he went, picked up about 100 receivers. This is where the earthquake occurred. The earthquake occur occurred at sea. That's why we had all, all this uh, water devastation. Um, and he tried to look um, as you start away from the earthquake, going to, toward the earthquake and after the earthquake, that, what do we see in terms of changes in the atmosphere? Um, and he display that in plots. Those plots, what you're going to see, they're going to vary in color. The, the red colors are very high value. The yellow col colors are in between, and the blue colors are low values. Okay? All right. And here's the thing that he showed. So at two, 2 minutes 27 seconds bef before the earthquake, you have very high values here. Okay? 34 seconds before the earthquake, you go from here to here. Now, how could that, ha that, that have happened? You have a hole in the atmosphere. That's what's happening here. And if you go 3 minutes after, it's even worse, right? Right now, we're here, right? We, we're still timid, right? We're coming from here to right around here. But now we're coming from here to down here. Okay? And that was 3 minutes and 39 seconds after the earthquake. So again, this is showing the same kind of pattern. That as the earthquake is approaching, we see the same behavior in a totally different set of data. Okay? All right, so then Western Jordan came along. He said, well, if you guys are going to do some work in, in Haiti, I would like to investigate how many GPS uh, receivers can we place in an area and get some meaningful data. So he did all uh, simulated data. And what he did, that was him defending his thesis here. And that was in preparation for John. We thought we were going to go in Haiti and take data, but we never did, right, John? <laughs> but anyway, he did this, uh, uh, this simulation that was pretty interesting. So what he's looking at is, let's say he constructs a piece of the ionosphere. And he looks at a few GPS receivers in the ground and satellites. He wants to be able to tell you if there was an earthquake in this area, can he see it? And how many receivers that he need, does he need to see it? And how computationally in, intensive is that going to be? So those were his questions. So the first thing he did, he looked at you know, computation inverse in, uh, involving taking the inverse of a matrix. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. There's more goodies. So here is a simulation of the atmosphere. Uh, you can see these reddish and yellowish colors here simulating what you would see in the atmosphere if there was an earthquake. Okay? And then he looks at it for one, three, and seven receivers, trying to see how well he can reconstruct the, this data here. Okay? And then he went and got all fancy and slash. Sl you know, slide it in all directions to look at how the electron density uh, evolve. I'm not going to get too much into this, but this is the interesting part. So he compared two, met two methods. If you are using matrix inverse, or you, if you are doing it iterative methods, which is, which is a different way of doing the same thing, how well do you do? Clearly, you can see with one receiver here, this thing, this data, this is, this is, the, this is the truth, and this is the answer. You can see the data that you get from inverting matrices is dependent on the number of receivers you've got. You only have a, re a result where you have data and nothing out, while the iterative method is already filling the rest of the gap for you. Okay? If you go with three receivers, you get a little bit more. And here, this is getting better. And if you go for five receivers, you get a little bit more here. But this is definitely getting better. So what's the point? The point for him is that. If we use a minimum of about 7 to 10 receivers, we can do a pretty good job of reconstructing the ionosphere in Haiti if they're well placed. Okay? And we can use iterative met method to do, to do it quick. Those were the two things that came out of his investigation. First, we can use a minimum number of receivers. We don't need 100. 10 will do. And second, we can do a very good job using iterative methods to reconstruct what the ionosphere was. So that was good. So now we come to Mr. John. I'm not going to say too much about his thesis because he's going to discuss it himself, right? But John says one of the problems that, that we found in what Joseph did 
is that he did is he looked at the ionosphere with all disturbance in it. So in other words, there's a lot of errors in measuring this TEC. A lot of other errors. Jo Joseph never removed these errors. His theory was whatever he's seeing in the fluctuation is over the errors. Like, so he, he takes the errors as a baseline. Whatever is jumping over that, that will be the disturbance. That's a risky assumption, but that was his assumption, right? So the task that we gave John is remove all the errors, all of them, and do the same analysis to see if we see the same thing. Now, removing all the, his errors is, well, this is a good, good looking man here. Uh, removing all these errors is not a simple job. Why is that the case? Well, you have errors in a number of areas. You know, the, um, the satellite and the receivers have different clocks. That's an error. Um, you have the receivers themselves have a clock that has an error. And then you have the fact that you go into the atmosphere, you have an error. So the idea for him was to remove all these three errors from the data. So what did he do? Yeah, well, I have to tell you, very difficult to do that, OK? Um, so when I started doing this, I had some friend out of uh, MITA stack, and I say, you guys have been doing this for a long time. Can I borrow your code? They said, no way. We're like, this is proprietary code. You can't use that. I said, OK. I had a couple of friends at JPL. I called them. I said, you guys going to help me out here? No go. Proprietary code. Can't use it. So I'm like, well, I guess I'm on, I'm, I'm on my own here, right? So I said, there must be some other group that may have tried this. Let's see even if they didn't, have, they didn't have full success. Let's see if we can use their code. So we found a group in China that had developed a very elaborate piece of code to do it. They never used it for the, what we're doing, the ionosphere, but they used it to show that they could remove all the errors, OK? So I, saw, I told you, and if you can start with that, replicate that code, make it work, and then now we're going to turn around and use it for our purposes, then maybe it will be golden. I thought probably he'll never finish with this. But to my surprise, John went to work over summer and a half here or something, and he came up with, here's the first plot that he's come up, coming up with. Again, this is five minutes, 22 seconds before the earthquake. Here's 32 seconds before, the, that's the earthquake in Japan now. Okay, not here. And this is 16 seconds after the earthquake, and it's 4 minutes and 12 seconds after the earthquake. What do we see? Same deal. Right? We see fluctuations from here to here in less than a minute. That something is wrong, right? I don't know what it is, right? Because I know if I say it's earthquake that I'm predicting, predicting a bunch of scientists are going to jump on me, and so you can't say that. Uh, we cannot predict earthquake, and that's true. We can forecast, and we can say that we think, just like they, they say it's going to be snow sometimes, they say it's 12 feet, and it's 2 sometimes, they say 12 is 24, right? <laughs> so the same thing here. We think we can say something definitive, but at least now that we are, we are confident that we've removed all the errors, we're seeing the same thing. So then I challenged John Schroeder, because he was done a month before. His thesis was due. I said, well, good, you're on a wall. Now I want you to take pockets. Take a pocket just like a, um, a smaller pocket in different areas to see if you see the same thing. And he started doing that. So here's a pocket, a little pocket somewhere. And here's the result again. You can see the same thing. I didn't look at the time, but it's the same kind of structure that you, you're jumping from here to here in less than three or four minutes. And something, that's not the way the ionosphere behaves. That I think, as an atmospheric model, I can say that's the case. That's not the way the ionosphere behaves. Okay? The ionosphere is a smooth medium. It, it can only behave like that if something is causing it to, to happen. And the things that can cause it to happen have to be magnetic, sco, so, magnetic storm or other things which are not happening here. Okay? So at least we can say something is happening here that we may not know completely, but we have suspicion that it's related a quick activity. All right. I've done a whole lot of talking, so what do we do from now? So the best thing is probably there's, I'm confident we can do two papers with John very easily, OK? Very high-end paper in his own paper that he's going to submit to Young Journal of Investigators. I have no doubt he's going to publish that. But coming up, what's going on is I've been working with a group of scientists, the same group of guys that started with this video. 
and about uh, two, three, four, five, six countries. And these countries are along the, those three countries, the four countries, they share a fault line. line. So that's, that's very interesting because the same fault line cross all four countries. So you can actually do collaborative work with these four countries, place those, those uh, GPS receivers strategic position along this line and get some interesting result. And then we have these two countries who themselves share a fault line in South America that we threw in there because they have high seismic activity all the time. And the idea is to see whether or not we can start with the first kind of global earthquake forecasting system. As whether this is going to watch over the fault line over a long period of time and we'll be able to look at it and see what we see. Okay? So I think by the time we start this, maybe over a year, we will start being able to definitively say there is correlation or not. Okay? At least that's what I'm hoping. Okay. All right. I'm done here. Questions? Thank you. Any questions? Nobody curious? But whether this stuff is true or not? Whether, whether I'm selling you a bill of goods? Or <laughs> no questions. Question. Yeah? So uh, if you go back a couple of slides, uh, I think to John here, that's one. I think what you said. And then my question is if you went back an hour before and looked at five minute areas or something, would you see the same thing? I think you said. I think you can see this behavior even a day before. I think what we need to do is go maybe a month before, a few months before even, to see if we see that. And we shouldn't see it. I mean, my hope, my thinking is that we shouldn't see it. Okay? You said something like that's not the way the atmosphere is. Right, because the, 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 the short term, you don't see the short term fluctuations? Um, only if there are other causes. So the atmosphere, the, 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 the atmosphere is exponential. So it's a, it's a nonlinear exponential, but it's exponential. So, you know, smooth behavior. So the only time it will do or something like this is you have some external forces that's stripping electrons away. And there's such a thing. You can have a geomagnetic storm that will do it. You can have um, the solar cycle when you have sunspot cycle come around every 11 years and that does it. You can have solar flares will do it. So there were none of these things around that time. Right? So it could not have come to it from any of these. Right? So it has to be something else. So you're thinking, you're thinking as you come up to an earthquake, we maybe have these spikes and they right. get more frequent or right. bigger in amplitude. Right. Right. Like right. That. And as, as that, they, they create those electrons that we're saying, they travel. So it's either they, they bunch or they create these destructive patterns where, where you see things like this. Like basically a hole. It's a complete hole in the atmosphere, really, which is not uh, physically, uh, cannot be physically accounted for unless you have something else creating it. So maybe when you looked at, now this is back maybe to the satellite data, when you looked at a month, uh, it looked like 25 days out of the month was normal, and there were only four or five days that it spiked. That might Right, right, right. So the other thing, so what Jenna has and then I haven't asked him to do that, because that's a lot of work, just this. I mean, it's, yeah. what, I don't know, six, seven thousand lines of code. I mean, it's a lot of work. But I'll let him explain it to you. I don't want to steal his thunder. There's a lot of stuff that goes on to get here. Okay? So what we haven't done is do some sort of statistical uh, study like Michael Wyan did. Looked at over a month. So if you're looking at it from month to month, can you see changes? And then you, you dive in when you see a month, dive in when the changes occur. You see what I'm saying? So you go two months before, one month before, and then if one month before you start seeing something, then you can start going every day and see whether the changes continue. Now, one of the biggest problems in the community is how do you definitively determine that you can say something is happening? That has not been answered. All we're looking at is changes that we don't understand that are close to earthquakes, earthquake time. That's all we're looking at right now. Yeah. Any questions? 
All right, I'm good. I almost lost my voice. Yes. When he pulled off, uh, when John pulled off the uh, subset of the. Yeah, here. How many were they? Well, he's trying several pockets and running into a bug with his code now where some pockets were, some pockets don't. We're trying to, I'm trying to, I've got that code that I've, I went to look at since three days ago. I haven't had the time, but so what I want him to do is take pockets everywhere, take them far away from the epicenter. And you forgot to put the epicenter there, my friend. So the epicenter is somewhere here. So take them close to the epicenter, away from the epicenter, kind of thing like that, to get better feel for what's going on. How many, how many are in each pocket? I don't know. How many receivers did you use here? Do you remember? Maybe 30. 30? So typically in his work, in, the, in this thing here, uh, he was using 80, 87, right? Is that true? 84. 84. That's like very close to what Joe was doing. Okay? And then here, I want to see smaller pockets and see what's going on, kind of thing. So the next thing would be, if you had another year to go, no, you can, you can graduate. It would be to kind, of, to kind of average out over a period of time like Michael Bryan was doing to see what you see. Because it would be more statistically relevant, I think. But it's research. At least that'll keep me working for some more, some, 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 some many more years or something. So I thank you all for coming. Keep coming, okay? There's a lot of good people here. Remember, we have all your friends here. Where's that slide? Come in, come and give them a hard time <laughs> when they're defending their thesis. Don't let them get off the hook, right? Particularly those that are that uh, you have problem with. Make sure you look at exactly when they're presenting <laughs> and come and get them, okay? <laughs> all right, thank you all for coming. <laughs>